Good morning, everybody. This is Erica Swinson Elliott, and it is Thursday, April 8th, 2021. And you might end up hearing a little bit of banging going on, but that is because uh, there's repairmen in the condo unit above us. Uh, we had a a flood in the building and it's kind of affected everybody. So I think we'll be hearing hammers for quite some time. Um, okay, so today I'm gonna to talk about creativity and that's gonna be our theme for the day and how you as the quantum complex soul that you are uh, can affect and bring more creativity you know, out of the ether through you and sharing it sharing your skills and your strengths uh, and everything that you've learned, all your specializations with others that are coming behind us. Because isn't that our goal in life is to, when we connect, when we create, we expand ourselves, we expand the universe within, we're going inward, but we're also um, bringing the whole level of consciousness higher when we share what we've learned with others. So today I'm going to do it the opposite way. And so we're going to start with a creativity mudra, uh, which is a W shape. And you're going to put your little, like little bird's beak right there, connect your other fingers together like that. And then you're going to create like a little W shape um, with your elbows at your sides have your hands pointing forward and you're going to do a slow inhale and exhale through your nose. If you're doing this on your own, you would do this for three minutes at a minimum. You can set your little phone timer to, I like to use the ripple one, and then you can just hold that and breathe. Inhale and exhale through your nose with a straight spine, neck long. And for those of you who have, if this is your first video of mine that you're watching, uh, Mudras are yoga for your hands, and I have a video course on it, and I also um, have studied under Sabrina Mesco, who's my teacher. You can also study under her as well. And this particular one is, I've used, and a lot of stuff has come out. Sometimes if you're, if you're having like that writer's block or the creative block, fears in your way, this all of a sudden you can, you know, helps you adjust your body's subtle energy fields, that if you've gone to an acupuncture person, it's the same idea. You're just doing acupuncture to yourself with your own reboot, with your nadis, N-A-D-I is the line, and the chakras you might've heard of. So you're, those are your seven energy centers right here. Um, okay, so that's the creativity mudra. So one of the things that, I have recently published this February is this book, the February novel. And the January novel, I was like my very first book published, came out January, 2019. This one, February came out this year, 2021. The January novel I wrote over 10 years and the February one came out much more faster and is it therefore has a little bit of a different feel to it, uh, but it's still the same concept and they are connected books. So in my first, I think it was my first episode, this is my eighth. What if we came to realize that this life was only the expedition? I, I read this little summary here and I'm gonna read you the first chapter today out of the February novel. Sometimes one can almost feel the breath of our eternal souls tethered to our frail humanity. What if one future day we are all home and we are telling tales of our exotic travels and specialized knowledge gained with our fellow pilgrims? What if we come to realize that this life was only the expedition? The calendar novels are these stories telling things in an upside down, inside out sort of way. Okay, and then this is about the February novel tells the moving love story of two particular souls working across multiple lives and time spans. Again, humans have a chance to access the untold secrets of the elegant universe within, but the keys were hidden along the way. 
this story of their multi-level journey to unlock and share the mysteries lost within. This is the story. Okay, so first chapter, it's not that long. I think it's like a nice little, little um, teaser. Braving the journey. And then I have the uh, coordinates, which I don't know if you can really see that, but I have the coordinates of where in the world uh, he's located. Because as you can see, this is in the 2500s, so 500 years from now, and it's on the North American Upper Plains. So it's, it's kind of up above the Great Lakes is where these particular coordinates are. A vaporous mist hovered over the frozen grasses, dotting the tundra. The temperature crept upwards, releasing water from its frozen state into the air. The rolling plain stretched as far as the young man could see. Despite the overwhelming feeling of solitude evoked by this blank canvas, he continued to softly walk across the great expanse. His tribal leader's directions rang in his ears. Walk east towards the great waters of what was once called the Atlantic. Walk toward the rising sun and moon for at least one full moon cycle. So remember, this is 500 years from now. Once you reach the ocean, turn south until you reach a grouping of islands. You will eventually find the island we seek. It is called the Island of the Lady. He asked, but how am I to know that it's the right island? The elder replied, the legends ring true. There is no mistaking this place. For when you arrive, you will meet the lady face to face, and there will be no mistaking her for any other. But rest assured, for we taught you to speak and read their old English letters for this very mission. You may find a few ancient road signs that will help you. You may ask for directions, but be careful whom you may ask, for you will be a stranger among them. As the young man pondered these words, his fingers reached for the burden that he carried over his heart. The mysterious foreign object snugly fit in the small leather pouch that securely hung from sturdy twine, hand strung by their village, village's tanner. The most distressing aspect of his journey was his last conversation, which occurred the morning of his departure. The young man had already said his personal goodbyes to his family, and now he faced the same ancient village elder who stood teetering in the wind. His wrinkled, wizened face, finely polished by a life, lived on the windy plains. His piercing eyes set as permanent crescents beneath craggy brows. Yet this, these physical frailties seemed only to highlight the powerful soul force emanating from their leader. The young man stood mute in subdued awe, thinking upon the fact that this man had probably lived four of his own lifetimes already. And in these primitive times, no one lived that long. If it was not a violent accident or a human battle, it was a plague. Suddenly, the elder said with a terrible severity, from this day forward, your name is Brave, like Brave with a capital B. We have been waiting for you to come through us since the days of my father's father. For it has been in our history that our tribe will send the messenger forth. The proper time only known when the messenger is revealed and clearly understood. Quietly, he paused. The tip of his tongue wetted his cracked lips, seeming to give him courage to carry on. You are the messenger. Since you were born, you affirm that you were the bravest young man our village had seen. Assembling a small smile, he again paused and said, not that bravery is always paired with intelligence, as one must often be stupid to perform brave acts. A hawk screamed overhead as it circled the small village looking for a meal. With no small consternation, the young man fell to his knees in front of his elder, humbled by this tart assessment of his young life's athletic prowess. To this point, he was proud of being selected for this mysterious mission as their messenger. But now all of his sporting achievements seemed juvenile. The fear of the unknown awoke in his belly, unsettling his steely nerves even more. Brave whispered, what am I to do? And then the shocking missive, you must bring the object to the island of the lady. 
the lady will have her own agent whom you must work with closely. It will become your joint mission to unlock its mysteries. Brave was stuck, struck almost dumb. This was way beyond his abilities. He enjoyed winning the youthful competitions of wind sprints and upriver swims when the simple objective was to win. But this was different. He did not even know the actual goal. What object? What mystery? And suddenly his elder brought forth the leather pouch. And solemnly he said, this is a key to our past and therefore our future. It explains much that we have lost, but it needs the right people and processes applied. It was our job to keep it safe until the right time. And again, with that intimidating pause, he licked his lips again before he continued. And the time is now, for you are definitely the messenger. Take it, trust those of the island of the lady, for they also hold some of the keys to unlock the mystery of our futures. And that is the end of chapter one. So I just, lo I love the um, whole tundra. I could see that in my mind um, while I was writing it. And strangely about the plague and well, maybe not so strangely, that all uh, came out. I was writing that probably three months before the um, Corona Wuhan plague virus was revealed. So it was definitely out there in the psyche somewhere and it came out in an aspect in this novel as well without me knowing it. And then um, I'm going to go, so that was the, let's see, I can like no, we're good. Okay, so this is like the little enamel nug. That's the same um, drawing that I did. That's my original art. So when we're talking about creativity, once you create one, one thing, it can be incorporated into a lot of places, right? So this was originally a pencil because I love pencil drawings. And um, I'm talking about the DNA in the February novel. And that is like a little abstract, little scarfy looking thing that you know, can represent DNA as well. So that's what that little encoding is there. Um, and then my publisher you know, turns it into a really cool book cover that I couldn't do on my own. Uh, there's a little girl down here that's part of the story. And she actually came out of an original dream that I had a few years before. So if you've ever kept a dream journal, if you haven't, start one. And then you can, um, when you go back, you realize it connects some dots in your life somehow. It's very mysterious to me. So part of one of my real dreams is embedded in this novel. Um, here is the shop and you can always get to the shop right from my website here. Click on shop and it'll take you over here to it's a, it's a Shopify store. And here is the little brave warrior. Um, so he ends up meeting a girl in the book and I kind of intentionally made it that you could look at this is the girl or the boy. I, in my mind, it's brave. You know, it's him and then, um, but some people see it as the girl. So I have, uh, I love this one, the blue. I really like the blue on the ceramic. So it's like the typical eight ounce mug, but I just like that it has, it has like a little brave warrior you can see on the side and it has like my little logo on there. So when we're thinking about, think about yourself with creativity um, and you, have something creative inside of you. This is, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. So if you are interested in mudras, this is my mudra uh, course, and I'm on the Thinkific platform. You can access this through my website so you don't have to remember all these different ones. Um, and then you could also take Sabrina's courses and her books that I, that I read um, and promote. Okay, so then the next thing I wanna talk about I'm going to move segments and this is about being creative as well. This is a, a firm that I partner with and I've hired. They go by their acronym now, TOA Global. The outsourced accountant is what the acronym TOA stands for. And it's an offshore accounting firm. It was originally founded in Australia and I am one of their 550 client firms around the globe. 
And this is how I met Arnell, who I hired through TOA. So one of the beautiful things um, about TOA is you're basically hiring an HR firm. They originally started for Australian accounting firms, but there's there's a lot less Australians than there are Americans. So the American market is, you know, a big market that if you figure out a process like they have, which they're excellent at, um, you know, bringing it to the American market is where they're targeting next. So if you want more information about that, you want a personal testimonial, you could always reach out to me and, um, you know, consult with me for an hour about how this would potentially apply. They, you, if you're not an accounting firm, but you're looking for a virtual assistant who can help you with um, running your digital empire that you're building, this would be a great resource to go to and that you could have like one of the things Arnell does for me is he does my um, schedule, he books my meetings. He manages my Google Drive with the 8 million documents that are in there and scanning them and getting them up and running. So there's a lot of things that um, you can do more cost effectively and also have full-time support uh, versus trying to maybe train someone directly here. The other great thing, I think that TOA brings to the table is that you basically have outsourced your HR function. So I had time and time again tried to grow uh, um, a tax return preparer, uh, an executive assistant, hire someone in the US um, and do it that way. But if that person leaves or ends up getting, now, now you have to start over again. So you're already having a resource where the time is being done and they're sending out the uh, advertisements for you and the classifieds uh, and getting really highly qualified people that have already been background checked. So a lot of that time and effort is already been done. And then on top of it, they, this particular, there's a lot of, there's not, they're not the only game in town. There's other offshore accounting firms. So one of the reasons why this model works so well is that they, TOA is based in the Philippines and they have, they're the number two accounting firm size-wise and level-wise in the Philippines. I think Ernst & Young has a whole offshore firm there and I think they're number one there. So they're not, all the accounting firms here in the U.S. are doing this one way or, or the other. You just might not, it might not be transparent to you. Um, but the great thing about this firm is it's reaching out to firms like me where you you're, have one to, you know, five employees and um, they're set and built to help people like myself. So having Arnell on my team uh, has changed my life because he has really brought a lot of efficiencies and uh, We've built a lot of standard operating procedure manuals together. So one of the things that we're putting together will go on the Endeavor University platform as well. You'll be able to find through the website is digital content about technical how to. So all of the um, time that I've spent developing an online firm and building out an online firm that you can learn from my mistakes and uh, my investment of time, and then you can start a few steps ahead of me uh, with that skill set in mind, and you can take and apply to your firm what it is that you might need. And again, if you might be a realtor and not an accountant, you there's a lot of uh, if you might be a digital content creator, that's all you do full time, and you're getting busier and busier and busier. So if you're already digital and already have a digital firm having a, a full-time resource that's a lot more, that's something you couldn't afford to do here in the United States because of our much higher cost of living here than in the Philippines, here's a way for you to access a much more reasonable price point that someone is dedicated to working for you. And having someone efficient on your team, like the TOA hires, makes a huge difference in that 
I've become more profitable, more efficient. So we're kind of to the point, we might need to hire a second person um, already. And it's it's been just a year. So that's it on TOA. I wanted to give a little shout out to TOA and also to Arnell, who is an excellent uh, team member now with me. So I think we did everything with that. And I think the last thing I'm just going to touch on, I'm, I'm not really going to do a tax thing too much, but I'm, this is more elegant turf tax benefits. So we're all familiar now with Airbnb and what that is. Um, and it's obviously a huge global empire now. What a, there's a lot of tax implications around this for you to register now on Airbnb. And this is what happens when people find a new niche. It takes it doesn't take the regulators that long to find a way to tax you in a new way. So for example, if you were here in South Florida, uh, where I am part of the time, um, Airbnb, you have to register in your county and say you're and pay a bed tax. And that bed tax is 13% of your revenue. So you already have to like pass that through. You already like have to increase your price by 13%. The revenue though is huge, and if you don't if you don't register, like the state doesn't know that you're, you know, renting, right? So like this is how they kind of capture you into the revenue stream. Uh, it's very painful. I've had to do it for a few uh, clients, and it's like, you know, makes it it are, it already kind of takes the fun the fun out of it. But if you can do the short term rentals over long-term rentals. And I'll use the South Florida as, a, as the continued example, is if you um, rent for six months plus one day, you're considered a long-term rental and you do not have to register and you do not have to pay a bed tax, which is like a, what a hotel would pay. So when you stay at a hotel and you see like 8,000 different little taxes on there, one of them is a, is a bed tax equivalent. Um, so they're forcing people making money off of renting out their residences to be treated like a hotel and like a, a big, you know, big business. So if you rent less than six months, if it's a three month rental, it's a one month rental, you have to pay this 13% bed tax here in South Florida. So each of you know state, county, city is different and we'll have a different rate, but they're all figuring out this game. The other benefit about being a short-term renter, like meaning you're the landlord and you're renting out some piece of your property, is that you can, you have more control over leases. So one of the problems with the long-term lease is you know, people don't pay their rent. I have clients that have this. You can't get them out because most of the, the renter, especially in COVID, they can not pay, they can basically bankrupt you and you have to like put your house into foreclosure if you have a mortgage on it because you're not allowed to evict them and they don't have to pay you. So it's very unfair right now to residential landlords um, and it's kind of being set up so like the big you know, corporate guys can come swooping in that have thousands and thousands of units and you know buy you out at pennies on the dollar kind of scenario. So be careful as you're going into this. So, so I would come back again that the Airbnb gives you a better level of protection because they basically are signing a hotel short-term lease with you. So you can evict people easier that don't pay you. And in Airbnb world, obviously you're paying ahead of time. So um, it's a, it's a, that's a better scenario. I also have a client that they, converted for all the reasons we just discussed from a long-term rentals to short-term rentals here in South Florida. And just to use an example, if it, the going rate was 1500 a month to 2000 a month, I think approximately is their units. They're now renting out those same two units through Airbnb and other properties and they are tripling their rental income. So instead of 2,000 a month to one person, they're running at like the going seasonal rate of 200, 250 a month, or a night, I mean. 
and they're making like 6,000 a month in rental income. So it, it's tripling rental income. So it, you don't, if you haven't been in this space, just think about this. There's also tax benefits about having um, rental properties on your tax return. And there's a whole bunch of variations from passive income, passive losses to real estate professionals, uh, net operating losses, depreciation, acceleration. So a whole bunch of tax benefits. So it's another reason to consider it. And they're still, they've been around since 1986 and before. So um, I don't think they're going away anytime soon for the tax benefits for rental properties. So that's kind of, I did it backwards today from the, I usually start with like the tax minute and the elegant turf. And this time we did it the other way around. We started with the mudra and um, ended it with the, the technical stuff at the end for a little you know, mix of, um, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to get bored, right? So you have to keep mixing it up. So that is it for today, April 8th, Thursday, 2021. Talk to you soon. See if I can figure out how to stop this.